Good evening. Y'all could have continued the conversation. Well, we were talking about you, sir, weren't we? <laughs> I know. I know who you were talking about. Good evening to you. Good evening. Thank you for joining us, sir. I like to come early. That way I can hear all the chit chat. Uh huh. There you go.
Hello, everyone. I just want to start getting going. We have over 100 people already signed in, and we definitely sold out to the extent that one can sell out of a Zoom um, for this event. So um, I do want to get started because uh, we have a lot of information to cover, and we already have a lot of people here. I want to respect everybody's time. and. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. First of all, uh, I'm Jolene Ivey. I'm on the Prince George's County Council. I represent District 5. And I'd like to thank everybody for being here, for being involved citizens willing to participate in an effort to make our communities and Prince George's County an even better place to live. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the organizers of this evening's town hall. Thank you to the Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit for calling this event and for all their work to inform the community about this project. Uh, the Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit or MCRT will soon be certified as a 501c3. I'd like to note that we also have ASL interpreters for this evening. Thank you to my colleague, Council Member Daniel Glaros who represents District 3 for co-hosting with me tonight. Um, we have a number of um, VIPs and elected officials and those who are representing elected officials. And um, if you don't hear your name, it doesn't mean that you're not important. It means I don't know that you're here. So please do me a favor and in the chat, send just to me your name and title so I can make sure to acknowledge you because it's important that I do. Um, I do know that Jarrett Hawkins is here. Um, he's representing Senator Ben Cardin. Um, let's see, oh, I should have said him first. I just got a note that Tom Dernoga is here. Um, he's a council member representing District 1. And of course, um, Maglev would impact his district as well. Um, Bob Ross is here from the NAACP. Um, uh, Greenbelt. Mayor Colin Bird. Um, we have Martin Mitchell here. I, I believe that I understand that Martin Mitchell was going to say a, a word or two. I don't know if this would be the correct time. I would let Susan McCutcheon be the one to advise me on that. And let's see who else is on here. I'm starting to get messages in the chat. 
Um, let's see. Uh, we have um, Ab Abdullah, um, Abdul from uh, Maglev is here. Let's see, Jeff Shomish, the mayor of, um, is here. Let's see, who else am I getting? I'm getting a lot in at once. So excuse me for being a little bit distracted. Eve Schumann from um, Senator Chris Van Hollen's office is here. Uh, let's see, Stephen John, who's a new Carrollton council member is here. Uh, Bladensburg council member Jocelyn Rout is here. Councilman Brennis uh, Smith from Laurel is here. Jay Davis, council member from Greenbelt is here. And um, let's see, who else do I have right now? Uh, we have Doug Bowles here from Ward 3 in Colmar Manor. He's new, it's good to see you. Yes, um, Martin Mitchell from the Young Democrats did want to say a word and I'll give him the floor in one second. Uh, Reverend Richardson, who's the president of the Coalition of Central Prince George's County Community Organizations and Central Committee member from District 5 is here. Council member Marilyn Blount from Blatonsburg Council. And I have council member Lincoln Lashley from the city of New Carrollton. So that's, uh, we have council member Robert Day, who is uh, representing College Park. And let's see, that's what I have at the moment. So I, I could have Martin Mitchell, could you unmute yourself briefly and, and say a few words? Martin, I don't know if you're here or if you if I'm just not hearing you. Well, we'll go back to you in a bit. I believe Senator Pam Beidel is uh, either here or on the way. Um, let's see. Okay. Anthony Stevenson, one of my civic association presidents from Fox Lake Homeowners Association. So it's great to see you here. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, oh, I see Wayne Rogers and Ian Rainey. Um, let's see, I think that's what I have. And I did say Abdul Abdullah already, I believe. And here's the bottom line. This Maglev project, it's just not good public policy and it's not a wise expenditure of public funds. There are various and detailed reasons that will be presented this evening that different people have for opposing this project. But for me, it all boils down to this. Overall, building Maglev would not be the smart thing to do. Now, I know there'd be benefits for some people and some interests if this project were to go forward, but there are other and much better reasons overall why this project should not go forward. It's vital that we expand and build more tra mass transit, that's for sure. It's important in Prince George's and across the country that we develop and expand public transit. I strongly support it, and I know many of you do too, but this project is just not a wise way to do that. In Prince George's County, all our development decisions and transportation decisions should be based on the premise that we need to expand public transit. Plan Prince George's 2035, the county's strategic plan for future development has prioritized transit-oriented development centers as a key factor in creating strong, vibrant, sustainable, and walkable mixed-use communities. Strengthen, strengthening public transportation is needed to build a healthy and sustainable future. But as a society, we need to wean ourselves from our car-centric way of life and build environmentally wise and friendly communities. But Maglev is not the best way to do that. Upgrading and enhancing Amtrak and Mark train would be a far better alternative to Maglev. It would be expensive, but less expensive than Maglev by investing in, Man in Amtrak to give us a bigger bang for our buck than building Maglev. Amtrak has the plans and the ability to improve and upgrade its Northeast Corridor service, but it doesn't have the money to do so. Upgrading Amtrak would have less of an environmental impact and will cause less overall disruption than would Maglev. 
Amtrak currently spends over $700 million a year on maintenance and improvements, but that's nowhere near enough because of years of underinvestment. As a result, the trains must travel at slower speeds than the trains are capable of. Amtrak has stated that with enough investment to upgrade, the Amtrak to Sella would be able to travel between New York and Washington in about two hours. MagLab is a project that will disproportionately benefit the wealthy. Once again, the benefits will not be equitably distributed to, to benefit working families, and we've had enough of that. Also, as we've seen too often with other projects, the wonderful claims being made about the cost of building MagLab, I feel, will not stand up to scrutiny. The claims of how many jobs will be created are inflated. And as we've seen too often, the cost estimates are questionable and the possibility of delays and cost overruns should be understood. I think we've all seen that. For example, we should be wary of hidden and unexpected costs. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And when we're told that large infrastructure projects will have no cost to the taxpayers, be careful uh, and read the fine print. For just one example, the public-private partnership being touted to expand I-270 and the Beltway that the governor has said many times will have no impact on the taxpayers has hidden costs. WSSC has told us that the cost of relocating pipes and making other adjustments to make room for the expanded highways could cost up to $2 billion. To pay for it, there are estimates that our water bills could double or triple. So when you hear officials claim there will be little or no cost to taxpayers, history teaches us to take that with a grain of salt. It's important to understand that this is a federal issue and the decision whether approval will be granted is ultimately going to be made on the federal level. Our members of Congress are the ones who need to hear from us and be convinced. On the state level, there's legislation in Annapolis, which if passed would make it more difficult to, make, to build maglev by prohibiting it from going into certain areas and give the county council greater authority of that over uh, whether or not it would be able to be built. If building this project were good public policy and if building maglev was a wise, equitable, and beneficial expenditure of public funds, I'd support it, even if our community would not benefit directly. If this project were good public policy, I'd be out in the community trying to educate residents of its benefits overall. And I'd be arguing that we shouldn't be guilty of NIMBY, not in my backyard, but that's not the case. Our objections aren't just selfish NIMBY objections. This project simply is not good public policy. We can do better and the funds can be better spent to benefit more people. Tonight, we are fortunate to have a number of speakers to discuss various impacts Magalab would have on our community. Takesha James has been the mayor of Bladensburg since 2017. She'll discuss concerns our municipalities have. Louis Cerny is a professional railway engineering consultant whose career has included over 30 years of involvement with Maglab concepts. He's a former executive director of the American Railway Engineering Association. He will discuss safety issues. Owen Kelly is with the Sierra Club of Prince George's County and has expertise in computational and atmospheric sciences. He has studied and written about the forest within the Greenbelt National Historic Landmark, which is along the Maglav's proposed path. He will discuss the greenhouse gas impact of Maglav. Sam Drogi has worked as a biologist for the past 40 years. He will discuss the environmental impact. Dan Woomer is now a community activist who retired after a long career, including positions with Westinghouse Defense Center, Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory, and the U.S. Department of Energy. He'll discuss the concerns of residents in the area and the advantage of strengthening um, Amtrak as an alternative. Susan McCutcheon is a community activist and, and uh, Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit and Maryland Citizens Against the Northeast Maglev. We're going to have um, a question and answer portion at the end of our speaker presentations. Please post any questions you may have by clicking on the chat. Marlon Cruz of my staff will be monitoring your questions and taking notes. 
Maryland Coalition for Responsible Trans Transit will collect the remaining questions and then formulate responses that will be posted on their webpage. Now they can't promise to develop individual responses to every single question, but they will certainly try. The chat will be preserved so the folks from the coalition can view them and try to personally respond to any questions which have an email address included. So please include your email address. In your question. In a minute, by, the, in a minute. by the way, the website for uh, it should is mcrt-action.org. We're going to start tonight with Council Member Daniel Glaros. She represents District 3. She is a former chair of the Prince George's County Council and is now serving her second term. I'm honored to have her as a colleague and a friend. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Jolene, and uh, thank you everyone who is uh, joining us tonight. We have definitely a large audience and uh, I just wanna thank everyone, uh, particularly the uh, Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit, all of our citizen activists who've been active in Maglev from the very beginning when this was first um, discussed and, um, and all of my colleagues. I have four um, council members in the Prince George's County Council whose communities um, are affected by maglev and that includes councilmember jolene ivy and myself um, but also um, my other colleagues councilmember todd turner and, and councilmember tom dernoga um, so i want to thank all of them and all of you who are uh, listening from home while you could be doing other things but you're here to be informed um, and to see how you can um, take action on this um, so there's a um, few quick slides i'm going to go through um, and, um, and I also just wanna start my remarks with just a, a few other key things I think I'm gonna uh, share with this audience. So many of you know, I, I represent District 3 in Prince George's County. Um, I oftentimes tell people, I feel like I'm ground zero um, for transportation projects. Um, not only um, is the 495 expansion project um, impacting my district, uh, we are under construction with the purple line um, throughout District 3. Uh, we have two major uh, stations uh, with uh, Metro. Uh, we have multiple mark stations, both the Penn Line and the Camden Line come through my district. Um, and then uh, of course we have this big conversation happening uh, around Maglev. And um, from the very beginning, we've been following this conversation in my office and I've been following it because there's no way that you couldn't draw a line or uh, a route between Baltimore and DC and not touch some portion of District 3. So no matter what the analysis has been or what the route under evaluation has been, it has always been coming through District 3 here in Prince George's County. Um, and many of you also know me because I'm a tremendous advocate of mass transit. Um, and I, I think, I, you know, I say that because I think it's, it's really important, all these other projects that um, Councilmember Ivy and I work on together uh, that at the end of the day, I'm a strong supporter of mass transit because if done right, mass transit can address inequities, it can connect people to opportunities, it can grow local communities and support economic development. Um, and at the end of the day, this project in front of us today really in my mind just falls short of that. Um, and I say that as someone who oftentimes drives 295, um, I didn't grow up here in Prince George's County. I grew up in Maryland, up in Baltimore County. It's actually where my mother still lives on the east side of Baltimore County. Um, so I drive the 295 route a lot um, and I'm pretty familiar um, with the commute between um, Baltimore and DC. I've also been really active on something that I wanna share with you because I think it really fits with this conversation tonight. And that is, is just uh, before um, the Christmas holidays, um, a group I'm a I've been uh, affiliated with the Greater Washington Partnership released a uh, regional commuter rail vision. It's the capital region rail vision and I'll put a link to it in the chat box. Uh, but it's all about building commuter rail um, here in the region between Baltimore and DC and Virginia um, and really getting to regional commuter rail, um, a headway or frequent stops in our communities along the market rail alignment that would allow you to go directly through Union Station and into Virginia. Um, imagine a direct connection to the new Amazon headquarters, if you could do that by commuter rail. That would mean actually a 30 minute direct commute between New Carrollton um, and Crystal City or between the Seabrook Mark Station or the Bowie State University Mark Station. Um, 
So the potential for commuter rail is quite great. Um, and that report actually outlines exactly how we can make it happen um, and the initial investments um, that we need to be doing to really get to that fruition. Um, and as um, my colleague, Councilmember Jolene Ivey mentioned, commuter rail really offers that opportunity for local community benefits. Um, so I'll share information about that report that just got released. I hope you all will um, support it and advocate for it. Um, and I'm also gonna do a pitch um, for one of my friends over in Montgomery County, Delegate Solomon, um, who sponsored a bill last year, House Bill 1236, that was actually vetoed by Governor Hogan, um, that would establish a pilot program for exactly this expanded service I talk about on the marked trains beyond, beyond Union Station into Lafon Plaza and down into Northern Virginia. Uh, we actually have the opportunity to start piloting out now um, and um, our uh, General Assembly, our delegation is gonna have the opportunity to override that veto. Um, and I'm really hopeful that they will be doing that um, pretty soon. Uh, so with that, um, a few things that I will mention on maglev um, and um, as we get into the slides, and, and I, think, I think you've all heard this, you're gonna hear this throughout this presentation that at the end of the day, I think the real question on the table is, is the maglev proposal going to really support the masses? Um, what is this greater transportation vision for the state? You know, do we have a transportation vision? Um, or is the Maglev project, frankly, just the shiny new object that is a distraction to us really having a coherent transportation system? Uh, what are the precautions in place at the state level to protect our local communities and taxpayers on this project, both in the short and long term? Um, what is the cost of the ride? Who will use it? Um, and, and where will you be able to get to it? Um, I oftentimes use myself as an example all the time. I can't imagine using this to visit my mom up in Baltimore, for instance. Um, if I was to try to get on it, I'd have to drive into DC or Metro in DC and then come back out to Baltimore, a pretty long commute and a pretty expensive one. Uh, what is the connectivity to our transportation networks? What is the real community impact? Uh, what are the costs gonna be to the state? Um, this is not a free ride or um, a free lunch, as my colleague mentioned earlier. Um, and um, there are costs involved. And what is the environmental impact? Um, so the slide in front of you um, is pulled from the um, Maglev site. And it really gives you sort of the project overview map of the targeted area where the Maglev, and there's a few routes that they have been evaluating um, as part of this project. Next slide, please. Uh, so as you're taking a look at the cost to our communities, and you're going to see way more details come out, and I'm going to let our speakers talk more about this, um, but you'll see that there is real details in this mapping about um, what the routes are going to be. And when you start to look at the routes traveling through Prince George's County, what you'll notice is they, they go under schools. Um, they go under high schools like Eleanor Roosevelt High School. Um, they go under um, elementary schools like Beacon Heights Elementary School in my district. Um, they go under waterfront parks. Um, and then at the same point is while it's predominantly underground, as you might imagine, the whole system needs to be ventilated. Um, and so that you'll see that there's these ventilation locations um, that are across the site. Um, you can see them here in Riverdale and Woodlawn, uh, proposed actually very near to where our Purple Line maintenance yard would be. Um, and these are pretty significant structures. You can see one in Colmar Matter as well. Um, and I think these aerial views give you a sense of the scale of the structures. Um, and there's also vertical to the structures as well. So this is um, not something that's sort of like these small air vents that you might imagine when you're in DC and you're walking through DC and you walk over the air vent for um, the metro system. That's not what we're talking about here as part of it. And I think that's part of the growing concern we're hearing from our communities is what is really the impact um, that's going to be happening. What is actually the physical structures that's going to be seen? How are you going to access those physical structures? Are you going to have to access through my property to be able to get to them? Um, those are the types of questions that we're hearing a lot from residents asking us. Next slide, please. Um, here are some other routes that you see um, of different portions of it. So you see the proposed maglev route in Greenbelt. And as was mentioned earlier, um, Mayor Colin, Bird is on the um, Zoom meeting tonight and the Greenbelt um, City Council has been incredibly active on this and amazing leadership um, in, um, in, in focus on this. You can see the impacts that would be happening 
also to the environmental areas. And this is gonna be gone into a little bit more. And you can see also how the maglev will be passing um, near or under schools in the Lithicum area um, as the, it makes its way up to Baltimore and of course down to DC. Uh, so there is a lot to consider as you're thinking about the maglev proposal. I'm gonna stop my comments there. Um, and I know our next speaker, um, Mayor James is gonna speak even more about these types of impacts and particularly the impacts to our municipalities. Yes, she is. And um, that was great, Danielle. I really appreciate your comments. It really uh, added some context. Uh, I would, I neglected to mention that the sponsor of the bill that's in Annapolis this year is uh, Delegate Julian Ivey. So proud of him. I uh, did want to let you know that although I believe that uh, Councilmember Glaros mentioned Todd Turner, Councilman Turner is here tonight. Wanted to acknowledge him. We have two delegates who have also just joined us, Delegate Alonzo Washington and Delegate Geraldine Valentino Smith, as long as well as another mayor, uh, Tracy Gant from Edmonston. So uh, right now we're gonna turn to Mayor Takesha James from Bladensburg. She's been the mayor there since 2017 and we're gonna hear from her about some of the concerns that the municipalities have. Mayor James. Awesome, thank you so much Council Member Ivy for uh, the opportunity as well as Council Member Glaros. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to just give you a, a high view of the lens on the local level in terms of the municipal view of this um, train, the SE Maglev. Uh, initial concerns uh, for local communities stem around environmental impacts that this train may pose. The construction and the operation of this train pose a serious threat to our local environment and may cause irreversible damage to ecological systems. And as noted on the slide, constructing these tunnels to carry the train from Washington, D.C. into Prince George's County come right up under Bladensburg. And uh, given recent flooding concerns, uh, it just doesn't seem like a wise move to be putting a fast moving train in areas or communities in Prince George's County that are uh, prone to flooding issues. Uh, additionally, a neighboring community actually has landfills. And in a meeting with the developers early on in this process, when we were sharing our concerns, a local mayor actually brought that up and they weren't even aware that the routes that they were proposing were passing very near those. And you can imagine the danger that could be um, caused by any sort of impact with those landfills. Um, additionally, the ventilation station has been proposed to be located near our waterfront park. And that's seriously concerning for our residents as well as our elected officials because those are, that's a highly trafficked area, whether it's through bikers, pedestrians, uh, in addition to those who live very closely to that area. Uh, there's also wildlife impacts that could be considerable. Um, if you haven't had the privilege of being out on the Anacostia in that area, we have nests with um, bald eagles out there. And I can only imagine the sort of uh, devastation that could come from the emissions um, from this fast moving train. In addition, Bladensburg is a very historical area. And so we do have several historical properties, some of which date back to the 1700s. And while we're told this train does not have any vibrations, it will not affect the, um, the foundations of any buildings or structures, that's not been proven. We have nothing to put our hopes on other than the, the kind words of the developer. So that is tremendously concerning. In addition, it's a bit insulting that this train is using Prince George's County and municipalities like Bladensburg to pass through without prioritizing and making us a destination stop. And we have many assets and things that should be celebrated and visited by those from out, uh, outside of our communities, but this does not give us the opportunity. It just uses us to pass through and make profits for the developer. In addition, there will not be any uh, direct access as was previously stated by Council Member Glaros. And so to tout this as a, a matter of convenience, it's just not, um, it's not practical, nor is it realistic. And when it comes to the economic benefits that this is uh, being touted as bringing to local communities, again, that's really just not founded from residents to others in the community. 
uh, this angle has been pushed in order to foster support by the developer. But the reality is there's no guarantee that local community members will have jobs. It's possible, but it is not guaranteed. So to put out there that this is going to improve our community members financially, it's again, just not founded. Um, and there's just not enough to go on. And just sticking with that theme, uh, typically when developers have uh, projects, major projects such as this, they have construction companies that they have existing relationships with. Those construction companies have existing uh, workers. And sometimes they have a trend of just taking those workers with them project by project because they know they've got a track record, they've got the certifications necessary. And just having that background knowledge from those in the construction field, again, we can't hang our hat uh, assuming that this project is gonna improve the wealth or financial um, status of our local residents. Uh, if you could flip to the next slide, please. I do echo everything Council Member Ivy has stated as well as Council Member Glero so far, and um, as, long as, the, as well as the upcoming speakers. And just wanna say, I believe that we do have better options for municipalities. With the uh, Washington Council of Governments, their regional goals, they uh, refer to them as region, region forward. And these are goals for local communities just like ours to establish, to be sustainable, as well as achieve other, um, other goals. And for those residents who may not be familiar with the Washington Council of Governments, it's, just, it's a group of local leaders that come together. We connect, we um, create policies and plans to help shape our communities and make them stronger as our local communities in addition to our regions. And so in looking at those region forward goals, I wanted to just pull out a few examples of the kinds of things that your local leaders are, are looking to accomplish as we think about transportation and our community's needs. And so the first bullet states, we seek a transportation system that maximizes community connectivity and walkability while minimizing ecological harm to the region and the world beyond. With this train, it is not successfully operating anywhere. And we don't have enough data to let us know that it's not going to harm the local um, ecological systems. And nor is there evidence that it's going to help us create the other uh, goals. As we stated before, there's no access points in Prince George's County where residents can get on. Therefore, it's not helping us have community connectivity in our local communities. Uh, the other point being, we seek a transportation system that maximizes, again, um, I'm sorry, uh, the other, we seek a broad range of public and private transportation choices for our region, which maximize accessibility and affordability. And as the previous speaker stated, this train is going to be expensive. This is not going to be comparable to a metro ticket. And knowing that, and knowing um, the demographics of our communities, we have to be sensitive to not, to not allow this highly expensive train to be placed uh, in our communities. Uh, efforts to reduce the number of community I'm sorry, commuter trips and encourage smart growth really would be the best goal for municipalities and local communities. Our focus should be on bringing things that are important to our residents so that into the community so that they don't have to work um, in jobs that are one and a half, two hours away, let alone other states away as this you know, train promotes, this will allow you to get from here to Baltimore and eventually to New York in these very fast times. That's not the goal. Nowadays, people are more interested in living where they work Many want to be able to walk to work or bike to work or take mass transportation. And there's nothing in the, the plan for this type of train um, to allow it to fit into those sorts of goals. So it, it's very concerning. And I'll just end by saying collectively with our uh, grassroots, our grass tops, our elected officials, um, our community stakeholders, I just strongly believe that it's best for us to advocate for smart policies and plans to improve our existing mass transit opportunities that focus on light rail, heavy rail, as well as establishing more bikeable and walkable communities. These are things that are important as AARP has pointed out in research to retirees, but these are things that are also con um, con extremely important to young professionals coming out of school or starting families and the like. So, Knowing this information, having this sort of data at our disposal, it only makes sense to focus on solutions that support that data. So with that, I'll end and again, want to thank everyone for the opportunity. Thank you, Mayor James. You made excellent points. 
And um, one of them, part of them had to do with safety. And our next speaker is going to address that, Louis Cerny. Before he uh, takes the, the mic though, I did wanna acknowledge uh, that College Park Council Member Denise Mitchell has joined us. So thank you so much for, for being here with us. And Louis, uh, would you like to take over from here? Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak here. There are many safety concerns with the proposed SC maglev. I'm a professional railway engineering consultant whose career has included over 30 years of involvement with maglev. I have been a voting member of Federal Railroad Associ Association committees developing regulations for high-speed rail. Past proposals to build, build maglev systems in Florida, Pennsylvania, and Maryland using the German maglev system were not built, and for good reason. Despite certification by the German government that their maglev system was safe, on September 22, 2006, 70% of the passengers on a maglev train were killed and the rest injured in a maglev incident in Leipzig, Germany. Now, the Japanese government seeks to assure us of the safety of their SC maglev despite the number of passengers carried to date on their test track being only half the typical number of passengers carried by the Washington Metro pre-COVID in a single day. And the Japanese success with their wheel rail system does not automatically transfer to maglev. Justifications for the ongoing building of their own SC maglev are being questioned in Japan itself. The planned 2027 date for starting the first oper operation from Tokyo to Nagoya is unlikely to be met. This would make the United States the first place where the safety of SC maglev technology would be tested in high frequency commercial operation. Next slide, please. Put it back in there, put it back in the back. Safety rules need to be developed in a public process by the Federal Railroad Administration before construction approval is given. Uh, They're called the Rules of Particular the Applicability, RPA. So these need to be developed before the project is authorized. Right now we've got safety, instead of safety being first, we've got safety on the tail end of the process. The crash worthiness of the vehicles must be assessed for the safety of passengers if something goes wrong. The SC maglev should not evade the safety rules on vehicle strength now required for Amtrak. Promoters of SC maglev argue the computer systems will prevent a crash. So did the German government before 23 people were killed on that, in that Lathan maglev accident. There is a risk of a levitated maglev train rising out of the guideway that must be evaluated. Picture the train hitting a small object that momentarily lifts up the front end while traveling at over 300 miles an hour. Currently, there are no physical restraints to prevent the train from rising out of the guideway. Picture as the front end rises up, the tremendous air pressure with these walls on the side of the guideway uh, that would act on the underside of the train to lift it up like an, like an airplane wing. Below 93 miles an hour, the train will ride on retractable rubber tires, and this raises many safety issues. If there is a power interruption, the rubber wheels may need to support the train traveling at over 300 miles an hour uh, and contact the guideway instantaneously so the wheels would go from zero to 300 miles an hour. Uh, higher than airplane landing speeds. The dangers from the electromagnetic radiation need to be addressed. The November 2018 alternatives report says people underneath the guideway, quote, need to maintain a minimum of 20 feet below the magnets. And the Japanese uh, maglev has more electromagnetic radiation than the German does. In summary, there are many safety questions to be addressed, and the project should not be proceeding until they have been answered. A detailed look at some of these safety issues may well reveal one or more fatal flaws in the project, 
in which case the no-bill option is the only alternative. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. I do note that the Vice Mayor of Brentwood, Tanya Harrison, has joined us. So thank you so much for being here. Our next speaker is Owen Kelly. He's with the Sierra Club, and he's going to discuss the greenhouse, the greenhouse impact of magnet. Hey, um, so before this is the next Owen. speaker jumps in, I'm sorry, before the next speaker jumps on, if you have called in to participate, you must mute your own phone and you can find that on your um, dial setting, but please mute yourself so our, you can hear our speakers. Thank you. Um, I wanted to comment that there's over 250 people on this meeting and all of you participating are sending a powerful statement, possibly more powerful than anything I can say that there are citizens and elected officials who have concerns about the maglev and you're concerned enough to take time out of your lives to try to get some clarity. So I have a science background and when I heard that the yeah. maglev was supposed to reduce greenhouse gas emission and fight climate change, I said, let's take a look at that. So I'll look both at the carbon dioxide that would be emitted by building the track and by operating the maglev. So there's a trick in the transportation industry and that's figure out how much concrete and steel will be used to build a track. And that gives you an estimate of how much carbon dioxide will be emitted to build it entirely. And the maglev is gonna be either elevated or deep tunneled the whole way from Baltimore to Washington. So that's a lot of concrete and a lot of steel. And I ran the numbers and it's about half to one million or American tons of carbon dioxide that would be released to build the maglev. Now for operations, the maglev releases carbon dioxide and that's because it runs on electricity. And if you look at the mix of power in the state of Maryland, um, you can get an estimate for the carbon dioxide release to operate. And you can try to balance that against the advertised reduction in car travel. That would be a reduction in carbon dioxide. And the numbers are similar. It's kind of a wash whether you'd gain or lose carbon dioxide by operating the maglev. Now let's switch to a different channel. The Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail, the company that wants to build this train, says that it will reduce carbon dioxide emission by 2 million short tons. They don't say how you get that number. The only way I can see to do it is first you ignore the carbon dioxide to build the track. Then you ignore the carbon dioxide to generate the electricity that runs the train and you only calculate the carbon dioxide in the advertised reduction in car travel. If you take that annual number and multiply it by a few decades, you can get 2 million short tons in reduction. So if you're interested in the details of this calculation, it's in a blog post I wrote for the Sierra Club. The link is at the bottom. I'm not actually a board member or anything with the Sierra Club, but I did write that blog post for them. And I wanted to have a final thought about this reduction in car travel. So on the website for Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail, they claim that each year, 165 million miles of car travel will be avoided by people switching to the maglev, 165 million. If you look at the numbers, uh, road travel, travel on Maryland's highways increases gradually and on average about 500 to 600 million miles a year. At that rate, you build the maglev, you spend 10 to $15 billion on that, and a few months after you build it, even if the advertised reduction in car travel occurs, it's swamped out by the natural increase in traffic. So uh, if you see numbers on the Baltimore Washington Rapid Rail website or Facebook page, and there isn't uh, background papers explaining how they got those numbers, you should be somewhat suspicious. That's what I got. 
Well, thank you, Owen. I thought, think that was uh, excellent. Gave us a lot of great information. And, um, you know, greenhouse gas impact is certainly important when they, you're talking about the environment. And Sam Drogi is going to expound on that a bit. He's uh, has worked as a biologist for the past 40 years, and now he's going to discuss the environmental impact of MegLab. Thanks, council member. So if you take a look at the Baltimore, Washington area, and you either look at Google Earth or an aerial photograph, you'll see in the middle of that, a huge green area of forest and fields. This is the largest green conservation area between here and New York City along the 95 corridor. It also contains the residue of all the native plants and animals that used to live in this area, but surrounding it have largely been developed and we've lost in those areas most of it. It's a conservation area. It contains um, animals that no longer exist anywhere else. It has endangered species, has endangered habitats that exist nowhere else. It has sensitive wetlands and um, all the kinds of things you want to see in a protected area. It is comprised of National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service Refuge, the Beltsville Agriculture Research Station, and state and county and private lands that all work together to keep this area protected from development and there to filter our air, to provide wildlife and plant values to keep these animals that have nowhere else to go. And additionally, it has two major conservation research stations. So the Beltsville Agricultural Research Station is the largest agricultural research station in the world. It's there, it's a combination of experiments and fields and woodlands that it protects and the Patuxent Wildlife Research Station contains the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, which is the largest one within the United States. Maybe the world, we don't really know. So when you look at these kinds of things, you have to think of it as a whole. The entire area works and functions and animals and plants don't know about these boundaries, these federal lands that protect them, but they cross back and forth. So think of it as like a, a person. So if you had a person, you could, theoretically just lop off a hand. This would be very similar to what's going on here with the maglev program. So in the maglev program, we're asking, they're asking to transfer federal conservation properties and all the values that they contain um, to a private corporation so that they can site both the railway lines and also a 200 acre plus site that's gonna be used for as it's, it's basically an industrial zone. It's gonna be completely flattened. It's gonna have several feet thick of concrete and gravel. There's no value left. It is an industrial site, the type you would see in downtown Baltimore, not in a conservation area. Importantly is that in addition to lopping off a gigantic chunk of this conservation area that will no longer be part of the system, this whole, what you will also have is that um, this is precedent setting. None of these areas, none of these conservation areas, which have existed over a hundred years in the area, have ever been transferred to a private corporation. So once that gets transferred, then there's no reason that any other corporation that wants to um, have a piece of this open land, and it is the largest open area. So if you're a business, you would want this piece of land if you have a large project to site there, because it's there, no one's living there. It's kind of wasteland if you're an engineer doing calculations. But what happens then is that the next company that comes in, in addition to lopping off this one hand, so to speak, of the area of the conservation value, it's still functional. But the next one coming in is like, well, we need a place to drop toxic waste and store it. That is in the public good. You let the Maglev Corporation site their place there why can't we have some of the National Wildlife Refuge too? And you see where this is going. So the problem is this area, this is the only above ground part of the entire Maglev project. Everything else is underground. The one area that they choose to put in an industrial area and their train lines is the premier conservation uh, research centers in the nation, in the world sometimes, and contains hundreds of uh, rare and uncommon plants. Literally, we have documented a thousand plants. We have hundreds of publications from this area. It's completely inappropriate. 
There is no way to mitigate the siding of a train yard and train lines through this area. You can't replace it with something else. You can build another train line somewhere else. You cannot build another um, research plant and animal conservation community um, somewhere else. So I ask you to think about whether this is an appropriate um, giveaway of our lands. These are our lands. Your and my lands are sitting right there to a private corporation for their public gain for a project that has a lot of other kinds of problems. If they make a mistake and the lands are reversed, you don't get it back. This is a one-way street. It ratchets only to destruction. It's completely inappropriate for the kinds of lands that we are talking about them putting this industrial landscape on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. And um, next, Dan Woomer is going to speak. And uh, one of the topics he's going to cover is the importance of strengthening Amtrak. So uh, Dan, take it away. Good evening, I'm Dan Woomer. DWRR plans to run underground from Baltimore to Southern Anne Arundel County, above ground through most of Prince George's County, and back underground and on into DC. To support the tunneled section, there will be ventilation facilities built every three to four miles. Ventilation facilities can take up to one and a half acres in size. And along the route, BWRR will build several large power substations that will require power lines to feed the stations. This takes more land. Additionally, all facilities will need access roads for maintenance and emergency vehicles. According to BWRR, the tunnel will be 43 feet in diameter. It will run 80 to 150 feet below the surface as measured from the top of the guideway. With a two foot wall thickness and at 80 foot deep, the top of the tunnel would be about 35 feet under residential foundations. As commercial buildings sometimes have larger and deeper foundations, the top of the tunnel could be closer. The vibration during the boring process will be transmitted to the surrounding ground and into the building foundation and masonry walls. Concrete and masonry, when hit with continuous vibration, crack, weakening the foundation and walls. Cracks allow, allow water to infiltrate, which also weakens the walls. And with water leakage comes wet basements and potential health problems such as mold growth. The ventilation facilities are needed for three reasons to allow workers into the tunnel for maintenance, to provide a way for passengers to leave and in case of an, emer in case of an emergency, and will allow emergency personnel to enter. And last, in case of a fire, the ventilation facilities will exhaust the smoke out of the tunnel. Next slide, please. Let's think about an emergency in a tunnel. In case of an emergency, Passengers and emergency personnel would have to walk up to two miles, and they would also need to descend or ascend 80 to 150 feet to reach the surface. So I want you to ask yourself, how's that going to work for a firefighter carrying 50 to 70 pounds of gear? Or a disabled passenger trying to exit? In case of a fire, BWRR stated, the upstream ventilation facility would be started to inject fresh air into the tunnel. The downstream ventilation facility would be started to exhaust the smoke out of the tunnel and into the atmosphere. Now let's think about an SC maglev fire in the tunnel. A fire would be electrical and fueled by wire insulation, plastics, and lubricants. When these substances burn, they release a long list of toxic and cancer-causing compounds. These toxins and cancer-causing compounds would be released into the air. Anywhere near the ventilation facility will be exposed to these compounds. Radon gas is another, another concern. Radon gas occurs naturally. Radon gas is known to be cancer causing. AAMPG counties are hotspots for radon gas. Basements across AAMPG counties found to have radon gas have ventilation systems installed to keep the gas from building up. Now think about the miles long 43 foot diameter tunnel running 80 to 150 feet underground. It's going to be a large collector for radon gas. 
As the SC maglev runs through the tunnel, it'll act like a piston pushing the air into the ventilation facilities along its path. Air potentially containing radon gas vented into our communities. So I have another question for you to consider. What do you think will happen to the property and home values near, to the, near the ventilation facilities knowing that at any time they could be releasing toxins, cancer causing compounds and radioactive gas? Next slide, please. We think a far better alternative for the region's rail commuting future is to continue to upgrade and enhance Amtrak, Mark, and VRA. Amtrak and its predecessors have over 100 years of experience. As noted on this slide, Amtrak operates passenger rail services with over 21,000 miles of track across 46 states, including DC and Canada. Amtrak offers an array of services and serves a far broader spectrum of travelers and commuters than the SC Maglev will ever serve. Amtrak also coordinates with several local commuter train systems like Mark and VRE, as well as heavy freight, heavy rail freight operators. Amtrak has a long history of freight, commuter, and high-speed rail experience. BWRR has little to no experience in building or operating such systems. The Federal Railroad Administration, or FRA, has already completed a long and costly review of rail services needs in our region. They accepted and approved Amtrak's EIS and their Northeast Corridor Future Plan. Next slide, please. During this long and costly study, building an additional rail alignment was considered but was found to be too expensive and not needed when the plans for the existing systems upgrades and enhancements were considered. With FRA's approval of Amtrak's plan, Amtrak secured a $2.5 billion loan to start the upgrades and enhancements. For anyone who has commuted on Mark for any length of time, as I have, they can tell you all of the rails, ties, and railroads, railroad beds between Mark uses have been rebuilt. All high-speed continuous rail has been installed. Mark trains running from Union Station to Baltimore that express to Odington can and sometimes do run over 100 miles an hour. To see another example of Amtrak upgrades, visit the new BWI train station completed this year that services both Amtrak and Mark. The concrete structure built in the 60s has been replaced with a new, more comfortable station. Amtrak is currently building the next generation of Accela capable of over 200 miles an hour. The new Accela is being designed and built in the USA with American jobs, not overseas and imported into our country like the SC Maglev. SC, if the SC Maglev is allowed to be built, its building and operation will be in competition with Amtrak. Thus, the SC Maglev's DEIS must explain why their system is better when compared to Amtrak. Next slide, please. There are many questions and concerns with building the SC Maglev. We have spoken to a few this evening. We have heard some of a long list of safety issues and crash worthiness concerns of the SC Maglev itself. BWRR claims it's safe. BWRR cites the Japanese government has certified the safety of the SC Maglev. Well, so did the German government. Then came the crash on September 22, 2006, where 70% of the passengers were killed and the rest were injured. Germany has since pulled a plug on their Maglev. Remember the builders of the Titanic. They said it was unsinkable. There are claims that the SC Maglev is green. How does that square with a report from Japan that states the SC Maglev can use up to five times? Let me repeat that. It can use up to five times the energy as compared to steel-wheeled high-speed trains. We have heard how building the SC Maglev will destroy one of the last wildlife preserves of its kind on the East Coast. We have heard how the SC Maglev will destroy one of the nation's most important plant research areas. We've heard about the impacts on communities along the SC Maglev route. Loss of property, loss of property value, dangerous emissions, 
exposure to electromagnetic radiation, pollution during the build and with operations, increase of invasive plants and vermin, all are detrimental to the health of our community and our residents. We have heard there is a better alternative, Amtrak, and the ongoing improvements to existing trains and the broader array of system services. Amtrak is part of the integration of rail passenger service of Maryland, Virginia, and DC. SE Maglab is not integrated into this infrastructure. BWR, BWR makes many claims and has made many claims about jobs and costs and benefits. These are the same claims made to justify building many of the world's high-speed trains and maglev systems. Most never materialized. Many suffered from significant cost overruns. Many required significant government subsidies to continue building and operating. Many were shut down because costs escalated and the promises were never realized. For example, I would call your call you to look at the South Korea's maglev and the California high-speed rail fiasco. Next slide, please. PG and AA counties bear, bear all the pain without the gain. SC maglev is not a commuter system for typical residents living in AA and PG counties, or for that matter, Baltimore City either. Also note, a faster train does not translate to a faster trip. There is additional information that rebuts SC Maglev claims at the end of this presentation. You will be able to download a copy of this presentation from several websites noted later. And remember, don't be railroaded by SC Maglev claims and promises. Thank you for listening. Now it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to Susan McCutcheon. Thank you very much, Dan. Good evening, everyone. And um, I'm sorry, I don't have my video on. I apologize, there we are. Thank you, everyone. Good evening and thank you, speakers. Thank you, council members Ivy and Glaros and your staffs and uh, the ASL interpreters. I'm always amazed that they can interpret the way they do just ad hoc um, for taking time out of your busy schedules to host and facilitate this town hall and for providing information about important issues. And I'll emphasize uh, something was posted in the chat that that's unfair, et cetera. No, but this is the Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit Town Hall along with our representatives. So that's why we're talking about our issues. Finally, thank you to the attendees who joined us to find out more about issues related to the SC Maglev from the grassroots opposition, the, the opposition. We are community members, just as you, and appreciate your willingness to participate. Now is the time for action. What can you do? The SC Maglev Draft Environmental Impact Statement will be released for public comment on January 22nd. It will be a lengthy and very technical document. It will offer an assessment of two routes from which one route will be selected. However, the third choice is no build. We support the no build choice. What you can do, you can ask for a 180 day comment period to allow sufficient time for public review and comment. You can write your concerns and opposition for the record by email, letter, and web form according to instructions at the website provided on this slide. To assist you in composing your opposition comments, we offer a summary of our opposition points at the website provided on the slide for you to consider. The slide also provides specific information about how to direct your comments for the record. We also provide three websites where you can find much additional information to support our summary of opposition points. We're not pulling this out of the air. Again, we support the no build option. The Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit was established in late 2020 to address this topic. As, a, as a Prince George's County Council member said, uh, Ivy said, we will shortly have our nonprofit status. We plan to hold workshops on how to respond to the draft environmental impact statement. 
we will provide guidance and tips for preparing effective comments to address the technical elements. We are supporting the writing and distribution of the opposition points paper I described, as well as additional research papers. Thus far, our grassroots activists have donated out-of-pocket funds. Now, let me emphasize that. We are grassroots, and, and what we have done has been supported by just contributions of concerned citizens to support our efforts to produce yard signs, flyers, door hangers, surveys, and other educational materials for distribution in the communities along the proposed routes to help inform our residents. If you feel you can help, please go to the coalition's website, mcrt-action.org, and find out how you can contribute funds to support our efforts. Council member Jolene Ivey will now wrap up the presentation portion of this town hall and facilitate the open Q&A uh, portion uh, to address uh, uh, some of the uh, questions you may have this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. You have really been leading the charge and uh, we so appreciate you. And we have gotten lots of comments in the uh, chat about how great the speakers have been and how informative this has been. So um, let me see if we, we can do about trying to get some of the direct questions about this. Um, one question is um, from Greg Hughes, I see. It says, if Goddard, that, which is federal government, opposes, would that be sufficient to stop this from going forward? Um, Sam, I believe you had some answers for that. Hi, you know, you're going to have to repeat that. I'm busy chatting. So <laughs> <laughs> it's about uh, since it's a federal project, how would just tell us basically how we can stop it. That's really what the yeah. question comes down to. Yeah, there's there's uh, two. And from my opinion, and I'll let others speak on chat or maybe they can talk too by raising their hand. So um, there's two avenues. One is um, you have representatives um, at for yourself is uh, a good example. And there's all the way up to your federal representatives need to be involved. It's a little murky. Um, in terms of the federal lands, which I'm much more concerned about because of where I work, uh, those are, um, uh, there's a big possibility that those have to be approved by Congress. It's not given, but so you should let your congressional um, representatives know what your feelings are on the Maglev project in that, that light. And it would help to do that at all the, the various levels. So there's that part. The other part is that the environmental impact statement, the draft is coming out um, next week with the possibility that an early version might be available as soon as tomorrow. Um, you can look at that and there's a commenting avenue. I'm gonna let Susan add how that would be done specifically um, that allows you to bring up any concern that you wish. And the key is to not complain, but to point out issues that you think that are not addressed and talk to the issues specifically so that they have to address them. And there's a particular mechanism for that. And the Stop This Train and the, the organizations that um, Susan and others are running are better at it than I am in terms of how you would do that. Uh, yes, I would just add that, as, as I mentioned, uh, you can see on the slide, and everyone will receive it, I just saw in, this, in, the, the, in the chat, this, the, the presentations, um, the town hall, and the, um, and the um, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was just going to say. <laughs> uh, and, oh, and, and, the, uh, and the slideshow, excuse me, you will see the slide and it will indicate there uh, where you can look for, uh, for, for documentation, et cetera, um, and, uh, and, and, and ask us then for, for assistance, but certainly see for yourself what you would like to bring up or what your concerns are. So we will assist in that way. Thank you. This is, oh, and I wanted to add something to that. The question was, if one government agency opposes this, does that kill the project? Uh, to start out, it's more than one government agency that's expressed concerns. The above ground portion goes through a high tech corridor. Um, it's not just an ecological uh, valuable place, but there's Department of Defense, there's 
the Secret Service has facilities, there's a CIA. Um, so there's a lot of concern about um, the different agencies have expressed concerns. And no, I don't think that kills it. Um, and not being an expert on this, my sense is uh, Magalhaes proponents can argue great public utility overrides harm to this agency or that agency. So that's why it's important for people who have concerns about the maglev to closely examine the advertised benefits, because if they aren't real, then you can't justify the harm that various agencies are concerned about. Council member, do you mind if I tag on to those responses? Go right in. Thank you. In addition to the comment period, I do think as residents, um, I'm seeing civic association leaders here as well. It's important that you share your concerns with your federal representatives. So all of our congressional delegation because they're responsible for decisions at that federal level. Uh, I know a few years ago when this really started bubbling up, a couple of the mayors for Prince George's County were having regular meetings and trying to figure out how do we crack this night, you know, trying to meet with one congressional rep at a time. And it helped a little bit, but I have to tell you, your voice is equally powerful as your elected officials, and probably more so. If you're writing their offices, if you're emailing them, if you're calling them and expressing the dire concerns that you have, again, not emotional reactions, but the serious considerations that are backed up by information, that will help to eventually hopefully kill this train so we get to that no build option. So I really wanted to stress that these communities, well, uh, HOA presidents, I encourage you to get sign on letters for your respective communities and you pound our congressional delegation with your feedback. But thank you, Council Member Ivy. I just wanted to jump in with that. No, absolutely. And I um, believe that Council Member Dernoga wanted to jump in for a sec. Um, I just had a couple points. Mostly, I just want to thank um, Julian Ivey and Danielle Glaris working with the coalition to put on a uh, really informative uh, number of presentations from uh, either you, citizens. You went out for a second, Tom. You want to um, go back a bit? Yeah, bad, bad uh, connection here. I just want to thank you all and the coalition for an informative uh, presentation. I've seen a number of presentations over the last two years, have not been convinced by the, uh, the Maglev folks about their proposal. I did, um, and I agree with a lot of the objections. I, I did note in the chat box, I'm still unclear how the Bark property, Bellsville Agricultural Research Center, moves into private hands and is, has a uh, industrial rail yard built on it because state law prohibits that. So I'm curious what the workaround is. I know, um, I think uh, Sam wants to address that. I think that'd be interesting. I had, I had mm -hmm. not heard of that legislation. I know the BARC people very well and have um, talked to their environmental um, planners who are involved with um, trying to deal with um, this, this issue from their perspective. It's never been brought up. Um, the state law passed many years ago, but uh, our, our Senator J Jim Rosepeb had a lot to do with that, District 21. Uh, the, most of the BARC properties in District 21 and 23 and also Council District 1, and we're very protective of the BARC property. I'm glad you are. Um, there, you, are you aware of the um, uh, Treasury's uh, new... Uh, yes, all too well. Uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing. We've been yeah. dealing with the DIS on that project. And how is that how is that law influencing them? Or is it only because they're federal that they can get away with it? They're federal, it stays within federal hands. If you re read the, what I post, I'll post it again. Okay. Um, if it leaves the, the US government hands, actually That's I think it says FDA, it but it doesn't matter. Federal government's exempt from county and state uh, land use laws. That would be great. I just not in all this, you know, poking around with them, no one's ever mentioned it. So that's it. Really I just did. Yeah, you did. Good job. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm I'm uh, missing a few things in the chat. They're going by pretty fast, but um, 
in any event, there, there, there's one concern that has come up a few times, which has got to do with um, ultimately, if it is built, what would the long-term impact be on homes? Um, we've had problems just generally in the area with uh, people's homes being impacted by um, smaller projects than this. So that is something that also is a concern. And, um, you know, one thing that I've noticed is there's never, when we do hear from the other, the other side, and, and as uh, we've noted in the chat, this isn't, um, this isn't the forum to bring in their side. Uh, they've certainly had their own forums in the past and I don't believe that they invited these voices in, but that's fine. So this is the opportunity with a limited amount of time that we have today to hear what we are concerned about what the impacts could be. Um, I did want to note that um, Mary Lehman is here, delegate from District 21. So thanks for being here, um, Delegate Lehman. And you know, for the delegates and senators who popped in, um, I'd like to note that the delegation, the uh, session just started yesterday in Annapolis. So the next 90 days, or I guess 89 at this point, um, are really important. And some of the legislation that could pass could have an impact on this project. So keep an eye on what's going on in Annapolis and make sure you contact your own state reps, you know, wherever you live, um, because the, the ones who represent me are already on my side, so I don't have to bug them. But if you're not sure who your, uh, what position your delegates and senator might have, you might reach out and let them know what you think. That is very important, as we've said, especially right now when they're uh, considering legislation. So, um, and your voice matters, uh, as, as uh, Mayor James was saying earlier, your voice matters more to them than mine, because if I can't vote for them, they, you know, don't care about me so much. That's just kind of um, human nature. So please reach out to your delegates and senators and reach out even more importantly to your federal representatives. Um, Todd Turner, I don't know if you're still on, but I believe I saw you mention in the chat earlier um, some discussion you'd had with Anthony Brown. Is, is this true or did I misread that? Are you still here? Okay, he may have had to step out. I, I just noticed something. Zip Let's remember Ivy? Yes. I could probably fill in um, just a tad. Please. So um, let me actually just first thank our delegation because um, the Prince George's County delegation did send a letter uh, requesting that the comment period timeframe be extended. So I just really want to thank our delegates for that. Um, and I'll also share that um, the County Council is working on a similar letter. Um, I hope to do that with the County Executive and I want to thank Councilmember Todd Turner for working on that. Hopefully that will be on our agenda next Tuesday. Um, Councilmember Todd Turner was actually on a call earlier today um, with uh, Congressman Brown and raised both the concerns that he's hearing from the community, much of which has been echoed here tonight, as well as uh, the status of the FBI. As you know, we were in the running for the FBI before um, the current administration took uh, the, route, the helm. So um, he uh, was asking them both about the FBI and about Maglev, and once again, urging our, our congressman um, to be active on this project um, and echo the sentiments of the residents with their concerns. Thank you so much, Danielle. And Susan, I'm going to turn it back over to you for a few minutes. Um, we're nearing the end of our time, and I want to make sure that given how important this topic has been to you personally, I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to um, kind of wrap this up. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I hadn't really, <clears throat> excuse me, prepared to do that, but um, I don't know that I'm like the soul. I think that what you see here, I guess what I would say is... Um, 
it's a culmination of several years. I came on not certainly at the first, Dan Woomer and others. Um, there are people involved in this project uh, back when some of the routes were, uh, uh, there were more routes and Bowie was on there. So there are certainly people who've done a lot of work before their Greenbelt, the Greenbelt Advocates for Environmental and Social Justice have spearheaded uh, letter writing and various other things just on the, of their own, as I said, a grassroots effort. Um, at, they decided they, they joined it an, an early. Then I came, came along after um, when Senator Benson uh, was opposed to it in Glen Arden and um, she had a large meeting and that's where I first heard of it back and I guess I can't even remember now. <laughs> At any rate, um, I went to Greenbelt meetings. Uh, I have all the kudos to Greenbelt for really pushing from the first, but they're very, very seriously affected, uh, clearly. And also working with the Citizens Against the SC Maglev. And we've been working for some time, uh, trying to get uh, information out to get people, to inform people. We're, we're looking to ed educate in the sense of getting the information out so people are aware of it. A common response as, as we presented uh, as the our Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit presented to both uh, but both you, um, uh, council, council member Ivy and council member Glaros is that many people when you say the SC Maglev, they say, oh, that's the purple line, right? Oh, oh, that's the beltway widening. No, it's something different. Therefore, it's important to get out in, into the public what we're talking about. And that is the basis really for this. So uh, to try to get our, our message out, we, are, we don't have a lot of um, funds. We don't have a lot of clout, if you will, but we are strong because we're grassroots and we are bringing that out. We are uh, the Northeast Maglev, I mean, has an advantage. That's the fact of life. And so at any rate, again, I would bring that to attention that the, uh, it's important, the, uh, the uh, Maryland Coalition for Responsible Transit, and please look at the slide for finding more information. And I know a lot of you on here will still keep getting information from <laughs> distributed from me because that's how you know me. And um, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know uh, if uh, anyone else wanted to say a wrap up comment. I, I know that that's basically what we wanted to do was get the word out. I wanna say a particular shout out to two people not on this as presenting, but Pat Jackman and Victoria Reynolds, because they a lot of work as you and your staffs know, it takes a lot of work to put something together and to put presentations together. So it's very much appreciated you're willing, willing to uh, host this uh, for us to be able to spread the word and um, get people to thinking about what's uh, potentially happening, but thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you, all of you. And I want to make sure that everybody knows that we will email you tomorrow with the link to this recording, as well as the slides. So, um, you know, don't worry that you couldn't write fast enough or whatever. We will send this out to you tomorrow. And um, as long as we have your email address, you're going to get it. So no worries there. Well, and also a reminder that the questions will be accumulated, as you right. mentioned at the beginning, so that they're not just dropping. There's going to be more opportunity for us to, re to respond and correspond with appropriate people to answer some questions or to, to discuss them. Yes, and I have to say I've uh, enjoyed reading a lot of what was happening in the chat. Some of it wasn't necessarily a question, but there were comments. Some of them were kind of funny, but uh, I, I know there's a lot of engagement on this issue. And other than uh, uh, one or two people who apparently have are working for the project, everybody else on here has had comments that let me think that you are um, not embracing this as something that you want to have happen, uh, tunneling under Prince George's County and uh, not giving us any benefit, but more than that, not giving the kind of um, investment to Amtrak that makes more sense to us and um, not wanting to, to have a negative impact on the environment. Um, right now. So you know, we definitely appreciate you all coming out tonight. 
And may I add one more shout out? Because Absolutely, very it is your meeting, Susan, go for it. Oh, not just mine, oh no, please. But what I want to say is this, this is not just a group of like older people, like, oh, my house is in and yeah. This too is including, and I want to give a shout out to the very strong backing of the Prince George's County Young Democrats. So it is not just the voices of a lot of settled people who are doing this and that and the people don't care, you know, those old folks or something. There are a lot of people interested and a lot of people concerned. And that's when one mentioned um, uh, Mart, uh, Martin Mitchell wasn't early, uh, able to get on earlier. Uh, but at any rate, that is very important to say too. This is about all of us and all ages and municipality leaders. And it's not just a few disgruntled people just wanting to just get it out of our backyard, as you said earlier. Thank you. And actually, now that you brought up Martin Mitchell, he's still on the call. I don't know if he's got the um, got his finger near the button, if he could unmute himself, uh, maybe turn on his camera and say a few words. Martin, are you out there? Okay, well, maybe I was incorrect. It is head dropped off. Oh, are you there? No, okay. Well, let him know that I, I did try. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate you, and we will stay in touch. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone.